My name is David Lawler and I'm running for judge here in Williamson County. Okay, so talk a little bit about why you want to run for judge. What, what has uh, motivated you to run for the position? I'm running for judge for the same reason I went to law school. I want to have a positive impact on the community, but most importantly, I want to help keep Williamson County safe, a safe place to raise and live, our, a safe place to live and raise our families. And I think one of the ways that I want to do that is by trying to find a way to help end this drug epidemic. And that's certainly that everyone we've talked to so far, that's been a, a major issue. Well, judges have a lot of discretion in, in a lot of different regards, but whenever it comes to drug court, mental health court, veterans court, first of all, these elected judges get to decide whether or not these programs come to the county in the first place. So it's been passed by Illinois legislature to allow it, but judges from the specific county get to decide whether or not these programs are going to come, going to, come to the county or not. You're a practicing attorney, obviously that's one of the requirements. Talk about some of the other requirements and that are required for to be a judge and then how you kind of fit into that profile. Well, the basic requirements are that you have to be a licensed attorney, live in the state of Illinois, and be a resident of the county that you're running in. Okay. Talk about how you hold yourself accountable. It, it, that is probably the one key thing that a lot of people kind of ask about, especially, you know, in this day and age about you know, what's your reputation and, and accountability? How do you go about doing that? Well, I think one of the things that comes to mind is we become the average of the people that we spend the most time with. So I hold myself accountable from where I come from, where I've been raised, and the habits that I practice. So, you know, in terms of trustworthiness, things like that, the Illinois State Bar Association Judicial Advisory Poll rates each candidate roughly on a scale of 1 to 100 in a lot of di these different categories that are relevant. I scored the highest of the candidates in my race in integrity, impartiality, temperament, courtroom management, health, and sensitivity. And you referred to the survey that is sent out. Uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, how that is conducted and how, how everybody's kind of rated on that. So the Illinois State Bar Association is a organization where judges and attorneys of both parties are all members. There's a survey that's sent out to basically license judges and attorneys who have practiced with the candidates. So this particular poll is taken very seriously by judges and attorneys of both parties who rate the candidates roughly on a scale of one to 100 in a lot of different categories. And I scored the highest on six of the eight categories, integrity, impartiality, sensitivity, temperament, courtroom management, and health. Okay, very good. Um, now, your seat is just strictly for Williamson County. And the, the, but, I mean, can you go to some of the other counties or are you pretty much just restricted to Williamson County of, as a judge? If elected, I would primarily serve in Williamson County. But the chief judge of the particular county could ask for me to go serve in different counties as they need them. Like right now, we have kind of a shortage of judges, so some of the resident circuit judges are traveling to other counties to help fill in the gaps where they're needed. All within the first judicial district? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, talk a little bit about, I mean, you're going to be seeing civil cases, criminal cases. Talk about your background of, of how that's prepared you to handle a wide variety of cases, and I guess the type of cases that you would potentially be uh, hearing. Absolutely. I think my background suits me very well in that my first experience was that of a Williamson County prosecutor. I worked with Charles Garnotti, I'm sure you've heard of his name, where I gained extensive courtroom and trial experience. I, I later left and co-founded Lawler Brown Law Firm, where I've practiced throughout Southern Illinois in a variety of areas of law, both civil and criminal. I've handled virtually every type of case that a judge in Williamson County would need to hear. Uh, as a judge, you have to be impartial. Yes, and of sir. course, you know, attorneys, and you've been on the other side of the, of the bench, if you will, as an attorney. How do you maintain that impartiality? I mean, how do you, as a judge, what are you going to be thinking about telling yourself to remain somewhat neutral to, you know, to, to get over what, uh, or, or not to be sucked into what, you know, both opposing parties may be trying to tell you? How do you maintain that? Yeah, impartiality. Well, thankfully, I've been trained by some of the best. I've got a few retired judges who help on my campaign, who've helped give me advice, but judges are bound by the Illinois judicial canon of ethics. So we follow the rules. It's very simple. You know that you can't take into account anything that has to do with party, race, religion, or financial status. And how do you, do you communicate that to some attorneys sometimes if they're bringing up um, I guess arguments in a case, or and not, not so much attorneys, but I guess individuals who may not be represented. Do you in, do you have to inject some of that some, when that comes up? I'm sure attorneys might need reminded from time to time. You basically just have to focus on is this relevant, and if it's not, it's not going to come in. Okay. Let's talk about the economics. Uh, we're uh, a lot of the counties in southern Illinois probably don't have the biggest budgets. They're they're operating on tight budgets. As a judge, uh, you, 
you know, everyone is entitled to the equal amount of justice, but uh, you know, these courtrooms and everyone and everyone else associated uh, with it is uh, is paid by taxpayers. So, as a judge, what are things that you can do to make sure that the cases move along um, on a you know, ex expedite cases and, and kind of get everything moved through without getting bogged down and such like that. Well, I've practiced throughout Southern Illinois in a variety of different counties, and I've seen how different judges handle it. One of the things that you can do as a judge is you can put forth an order, a scheduling order, for example, that says, hey, this is when the case is going to be set for trial. This is the discovery deadline. This is how many depositions can be taken. This is when motions need to be filed by. And you have a lot of discretion to rule on. You know, we talked about before coming on the air, how are you going to decide when an expert should be appointed, appointed in, a, in a very difficult, complex criminal case? Thankfully, I've seen this from both sides of the aisle. You know, I worked as a Williams County prosecutor, and I've seen this as a defense attorney. You have to do a balancing test and make sure, ultimately, is this going to be a fair trial? Are you going to give this person, whether it's a plaintiff or a defendant, in a civil or a criminal case, a fair trial? As a judge, and, and again, this is probably an impartiality type issue, but if you hear evidence can you maybe sometimes say this This is maybe a case that should not go to trial, or is that something, is that overstepping your boundaries as a judge? Here's where it's interesting in a criminal case. If it's a criminal misdemeanor, the judge will not have any say until it goes to trial. With felony cases, however, judges will hear evidence if there's a preliminary hearing. So you're probably familiar, there's two ways that a criminal case can be brought forward past that probable cause hearing. One is a grand jury indictment. If that's the case, it's outside the purview of a judge. But if it's a preliminary hearing, a judge will have to make a determination. Is there sufficient evidence to establish probable cause? What does that mean? More likely true than not that a crime was committed and this particular defendant who's being charged has committed a crime. Yeah. And even like on warrants, for example, search warrants and, and arrest warrants, um, uh, I guess the prosecution or law enforcement, they have to present enough evidence to the judge to justify them committing, going out and doing this, correct? Absolutely. It's that same probable cause requirement. So there's a few different things that come into play. For a cop to pull you over, they have to have reasonable suspicion. What's that mean? Specific, articulable facts that a crime has been committed. For probable cause, it's a slightly higher threshold. Again, that more likely true than not. And then whenever you're going to trial in a criminal case, they have to prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the highest standard that exists in the justice system. Yeah. So as a prosecutor, did you ever have a judge tell you you don't have enough evidence to go with this case? So How often does that come up? Here's an interesting thing. So one of the judges who was helping out on my campaign, Judge John Speroni, he was a retired Williamson County judge. You could sort of watch the subtle cues whenever you're going through a preliminary hearing. If a judge would say something to the effect of, well, this is a preliminary hearing, so I'll find probable cause. You can kind of read between the lines to see hey, this judge is telling you you don't have a very strong case. But the other way would be sometimes you can go to what's called a settlement conference in a criminal case. You ask the judge to give an informal recommendation. You know, what are the strengths of this case? What would you likely sentence this person to? And it's pursuant to what's called Illinois Supreme Court Rule 402D. So you have the judge listen in, but you only do that if both the defense and the state agree, because otherwise that's what's interesting in a criminal case. The judge doesn't have any opportunity to see what sort of evidence exists except for what's charged in the information if it goes to a preliminary hearing or looking through the grand jury indictment. So that's, it's an interesting part of the criminal law where they don't have depositions like you do right. in a civil case. You're sort of limited to your opportunity to a trial. Right. Let's talk about temperament for judges. You know, yes, we, we've seen, um, you know, over the course of years, we've had, we've seen the um, judges that uh, have somewhat of an easy laid back personalities and, uh, mm -hmm. and others who, uh, you know, you walk in the courtroom, you know that they're the boss, they're ruling that. Tell us about your temperament and, and how you kind of picture yourself um, uh, overseeing the, you know, the, the courtroom. Well, I'm one of six boys. I'm number five in the, in the birth order. So I was raised by parents who will be married 50 years this year, and they raised me with a certain degree of discipline. My, I would say my temperament is very good, and with that Illinois State Bar Association Judicial Advisory Poll, I scored the highest of the candidates in my race with regards to temperament. So I can tell you I have good temperament, but you can also look to this survey to see what judges and attorneys from both parties have to say about me. Right. Um, now you're running as a Democrat. Yes, sir. And in this day and age, we know voters will be looking at party affiliation one way or the other. As, a, in, for, as far as the judicial system, you're supposed to be impartial and, uh, you know, and, and not necessarily take a one position or another. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you get a especially as a, in running as a judge, how do you get beyond the, the party affiliation and explain to voters of how to go about picking you other than whether you're Democrat or Republican? 
It's a good question. Most of the people I talk to, I ask them, are you looking at whether or not it's a Democrat or Republican? And they say they want to vote based on the candidate. So I don't see party affiliation coming into it too much. And for good reason. Once a judge is elected, they're required by law to be apolitical. So a judge is never going to be taking into consideration whether someone's a Republican or a Democrat. So it's really a moot issue in some ways. but. That's you know sort of the answer that I give to people when they ask me. Okay, and uh, one question. This is mainly for a, for a media question. Sure. Um, the Supreme Court, Illinois Supreme Court, has allowed uh, certain uh, many of the districts to allow cameras in a courtroom, mm -hmm. and of course we do have a a. Uh, have, have the ability to request that in the first judicial district. Mm -hmm. um, give me your opinion about having cameras in the courtroom and whether you think that's a good thing as far as allowing uh, voters and, and viewers and, and taxpayers to understand what's going on in the courtroom or do you think it infringes upon um, the individuals who are, who, who are on trial? I think cameras in the courtroom are a good thing for a very simple reason, transparency and accountability. Courtrooms are public, and judges represent the people. People have an interest in knowing what's going on in the courtroom. Now, certainly, there is a balancing test that you alluded to, which is, are we going to infringe upon someone's right to fair and speedy trial? So long as cameras are in the courtroom and they're not disrupting the trial, I think it's a good thing. You know, one of the things that might be interesting, though, is keep cameras rolling for the entire trial, because if you have the media that captures maybe 20 seconds <laughs> of, you know, a snippet, it doesn't portray the full picture, it might be nice to give the public a full glimpse of exactly what's going on throughout yeah. the trial. And, and certainly, um, you know, there's, there's um, as far as our organization is concerned, we don't televise entire, you know, trials. I, I think you'd have to go back to, sure. uh, you know, I'll go back years and years and years ago to the O.J. Simpson trial, which was, uh, yeah. and, and that was the daytime drama going on. But yeah, Unless you had it on streaming on, right. online or right, on online. the website, maybe. Right, yeah. yeah. So, more or less now we we are looking for the highlights we're looking for you know the those those moments in the courtroom sure all right well thanks for uh, coming in and talking to us and, and best of luck in your uh, race coming up right. thanks a lot mike all right thank you